Hello everyone, and welcome to the Support Vector Machines with Python lecture. In this lecture, we're going to use scikit-learn in Python to implement support vector machines on some built-in breast cancer data. Let's go ahead and jump to the Jupyter Notebook to get started. Okay, here I am at the Jupyter Notebook, and I'm going to go ahead and start by importing the libraries we're going to be using. I'll import my data libraries, which is pandas is pd and numpy as np and then my visualization libraries, matplotlib.pyplot as plt, and seaborn as sns. And since I'm using the Jupyter Notebook, I'm also going to go ahead and say matplotlib inline and run those cells. All right, now that everything is loaded, let's go ahead and grab the data. We're going to use the built-in breast cancer data set from scikit-learn. This is the same data set used in the principal component analysis lectures. We'll go ahead and say from sklearn.datasets, imports, load, underscore, breast, and then we can actually just tab autocomplete to grab breast cancer there. We'll say cancer as a variable is an instance of calling load breast cancer, and then we can explore cancer by just asking for the keys of cancer. You'll have the feature names, the target, the data, the actual description and the target names. So if you want a detailed description of this data set, you can just read through cancer, D-E-S-C-R, and it will go ahead and tell you the breast cancer data set. And basically what this is, it's 569 instances with 30 numeric attributes. And the prediction that you want to do as far as the class is whether or not this tumor for this breast cancer is malignant or benign. Okay, and you have a bunch of different data points here, such as the smoothness of the cancer or the tumor, uh, how compact it is, the perimeter, the area, etc. We're going to go ahead and now set up a data frame using these keys to actually grab this data. I'm going to say df underscore feet is equal to pd dot data frame. Pass in my data as cancer data. And then we'll go ahead and say the columns is equal to cancer feature names. And then if I check out what DF feet looks like, just the head of it, first two rows, it looks something like this. It has a bunch of numerical data and the actual column name. And we can go ahead and check info if we want some general information about the pandas data frame, as well as you can check out cancer target column to actually see the target 0 and 1. And if you want to see what they reference, you can go to target names and they reference malignant or benign. Okay, let's go ahead and do some exploratory data analysis. If you want to explore the data, you can go ahead and do anything you want with Seaborn or matplotlib. We'll actually skip this part officially. I do want you to explore the data using some sort of visualization, but since so many of the features are actually hard to interpret, such as mean smoothness or worst perimeter, unless you have an actual domain experience in cancer research and how tumors uh, actually work and what they look like and how you actually diagnose cancer, a lot of this visualization will be lost on you because you're not gonna be able to interpret the results of something like mean area versus mean smoothness. So we'll go ahead and let you do whatever visualizations you feel comfortable doing, but we'll go ahead and skip forward to the train test split and focus on actually running the machine learning model. But again, I would encourage you to kind of explore the data on what looks interesting to you. Okay, let's go ahead and go to train test split. As we know, we can just say from sklearn dot cross validation, import train test split, and calling train test split, I'll go ahead and do shift tab to see my options here in the documentation string. Scroll down till I see the example that I can just copy and paste here. And then I'm going to go ahead and say x train, x test, y train, y test. And I need to set up my x and y. So x is going to be my features, so df underscore feet. And y is going to be my target. So again, to check out the target, that was just the array of zeros and ones. So we can just say cancer target. 
Okay, now let's go ahead and set test size to 0 0.3 and random state to 101. Run that and we have our train test split data working correctly. Now that we have our data split, let's go ahead and train the support vector classifier. To actually grab the support vector classifier model, you'll go ahead and say from, let me go ahead and zoom in here a little bit more, from sklearn.svm import svc, just capital S, capital V, capital C, and then you can just instantiate the model and then train the model or fit the model to the training data. So X train, Y train, just as we've done a bunch of other times. Now something to note here is that you'll notice there's quite a few parameters such as gamma and C, as well as the degree, the kernel, etc. We're going to be taking a look at these later on, but for now let's go ahead and just predict using the default values and see how that works for us. I'll say predictions is equal to model dot predict off my test data and I'm going to import from sklearn.metrics import the classification report and the confusion matrix. Let's go ahead and print those out. We'll print the confusion matrix with Y test and our predictions. Then we will print a new line and we'll go ahead and then print the classification report again with Y test and the predictions. Okay, when we run this, we see something really interesting occur. Basically, what happened is this model of the default values predicted that no tumors were in the zero class. And you'll actually get a warning here. Uh, Psycholearn will warn you that precision and F score are ill defined and are being set to zero in labels with no predicted samples. And you see that from the confusion matrix as well. It basically predicted everything belonged to class one. Now, the reason this is happening that we're classifying everything into a single class is because our model needs to have its parameters adjusted. And it may also help to actually normalize the data as well when you're passing it into a support vector machine. What we can go ahead and do is search for the best parameters using a grid search. Now a grid search allows you to find the right parameters, such as like what C or gamma values to use. And finding those right parameters is usually a tricky task, but luckily we can be a little lazy and just try a bunch of combinations and see what works best. And this idea of creating a grid of parameters and just trying out all the best possible combinations is called a grid search. And this method is actually common enough that scikit-learn has this functional functionality built in. And we'll say from sklearn.grid underscore search import grid search CV. And grid search CV takes in a dictionary that describes the parameters that should be tried and a model to train. The grid of parameters is defined as a dictionary where the keys are the parameters and the values is basically a list of settings to be tested. Let me go ahead and show you what I mean by that. I'll make a variable called param underscore grid and it's going to be a dictionary. And this is going to be a dictionary where the keys are the actual parameters that go into the model you're using. In this case, we're using a support vector machine as our model, SVC, and we can see the various parameters that are available to us here. You can go ahead and do the reading in Introduction to Statistical Learning if you want to figure out or find out more about the mathematics behind the C and gamma values, as well as the kernels to choose from. But as an overall generalization, what you can say is that C controls the cost of misclassification on the training data. A large C value gives you low bias and high variance. Low bias because you penalize the cost of misclassification a lot with a larger C value. With a smaller C value, you're not going to penalize that cost as much, so it gives you a higher bias and a lower variance. So that has to do with that bias variance trade-off. Now the gamma parameter has to do with the free parameter of the Gaussian radial, radial basis function. And that's what this kernel is, the radial basis function. It's the default kernel and it's probably the best one to use usually by default, which is why it's a default in scikit-learn. 
but this gamma parameter is that free parameter in that radial basis function. And not to go too mathematical, but basically a small gamma means a Gaussian with a large variance. And technically speaking, a large gamma value is going to lead to a high bias and low variance in the model, or vice versa. So if the gamma is large, then variance is small, implying that support vector does not have a widespread influence. Again, I would recommend you go ahead and do the reading and introduction to statistical learning if you're interested in the actual mathematics behind support vector machines. If you're interested in more practical use case, you can just think of these C and gamma values as parameters that you can adjust with a grid search. So let's go ahead and jump back to show you how you can create a param grid in order to let scikit-learn choose the best values for you. We'll go ahead and call C as one of the parameters we want to test. And I'm going to test out quite a range. I'll say from 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100, and then 1,000. And then let's go ahead and test gamma. And I'm going to set that equal to, let's go ahead and say 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001. And then just to have some fun, we'll go even one order magnitude smaller. OK. So I have my param grid, and this is the grid I'm going to feed to the grid search CV. I'm going to create an object called grid, which is going to be an instantiation of grid search CV. And grid search CV is going to take my estimator as a parameter, and then the param grid. And there's a refit parameter as well, which is default set to true, and there's also a verbose argument. Let me go ahead and show you how you can fill this in. The first thing you do is pass in your estimator. In this case, we're using a support vector classifier. Then we pass in our param grid, the one we just created. And then you can go ahead and say verbose is equal to a certain number. So one of the great things about grid search CV is that it's essentially a meta estimator. It takes an estimator just like we did with SVC, that support vector classifier, and creates a new estimator that behaves exactly the same. In this case, just like a classifier. And you can go ahead and add refit is equal to true. Again, that's the default, so you don't have to worry about it. And you can choose verbose to be whatever number you want. The higher the number, the more verbose. And verbose just means the text output of the description of the process. I would recommend that you definitely put at least some number in verbose. Don't leave it as a default zero. Otherwise, you won't know whether or not your model's doing something. Because grid searches take a really long time, especially if you have a ton of parameters to check. So we'll go ahead and set verbose equal to 3. And what fit does when we call grid.fit, just like we would with any other model on our training data, let me go ahead and call it now. And you can see that this, since it's verbose, it's actually outputting these values for me. And what fit does, like I mentioned, is a bit more involved than usual. First, it's going to run the same loop with cross-validation to find the best parameter combination. Once it has the best combination, it runs fit again on all data passed to that fit without cross-validation to build a single new model using the best parameter setting. And you can actually grab the best parameter setting straight off of this grid object. You can go ahead and say grid and call best underscore params underscore, and it will return the combination of parameters that had the best cross-validation score. And you can actually also grab, if you wanted to, the best estimator and best score. OK. And we can actually rerun our predictions on this grid object, just like you would with a normal model. So we'll go ahead and say grid underscore predictions is equal to grid.predict off of x test. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing I did earlier with my confusion matrix, pass in my test value, and now I'm going to pass in my grid predictions. I'll print a new line, whoops, print a new line, and then print my classification report. Again with y test and grid predictions. And it looks like I spelled something wrong here, y test, yep. Let me fix that. There we go. Okay, so notice now our model is performing much, much better. 
In fact, it's actually performing very well. It's at around 95%, which is pretty great given the kind of model we're using. And if we go back to what we had earlier, it was just pretty much horrible. It just guessed everything was in class one. Okay, so hopefully you can now see the true power of using a grid search and a support vector machine is definitely one of those models where you're going to have to do a grid search. There's no real way to have an intuition as far as what is a good gamma value and what is a good C value. What you should be aware of though is grid searches can take a really long time, especially if, if you have a large data set and if you're doing a bunch of parameters, this sort of param grid for a grid search will take a long time. So what you're going to usually want to do in real life is set everything up, make sure your data is clean, uh, go ahead and do a grid search on a very small set of grids, just one or two, make sure that works correctly, and then once it does, you'll set your full param grid with as many um, default values as you want in your list as far as parameters, you'll run your grid search, and then you'll go do something else. Either you'll break for lunch, take a coffee, go do work, some other work, etc., while grid search is actually running. Since we're dealing with pretty simple values and this data set is not enormous, grid search actually ran pretty smoothly. And it'll depend on how fast your computer is as far as how long grid search will take to fully run. Let me go ahead and do a quick review of everything we just went over before we head off to the project. We went ahead and did our imports. We used Scikit-Learn's built-in breast cancer data set. We loaded the breast cancer data set, put it into a data frame, then we set exploratory data analysis to you. You go, go ahead and visualize anything you wanted to visualize. We did the train test split and we called the model SVC from the SVM family. We fit it to the training data, whoops. We set our predictions and saw when we did our confusion matrix and classification report that our model performed horribly. It just classified everything into one class. And we learned that we had to do a grid search using a param grid in order to find the best parameters. Then, once you actually run that grid search by passing in the estimator object, your param grid, and then you can state verbose equal to whatever number you want, we went ahead and used that just like we would if a model, say, grid.fit on the training data. Depending on how much uh, verbosity or how verbose it was, you can go ahead and check out the output here. And then you can grab the best parameters, grab the best estimator, but actually just call predictions just like you would with a normal model, and then check them out with the confusion matrix and classification report. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that lecture. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture.